today. My name is Shannon and I'm a marketing specialist over at Flowrite. We are super excited for our webinar today with Chad. There's a question uh, section over on the side, so please feel free to drop those in there at any point and we'll get to those at the end. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tim. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our Spring Fishing Tips webinar. Again, my name is Tim Pitcher, and I'm the Marine Business Manager with Flowrite Controls, and of course, working behind the scenes is Shannon Warren, um, our Marine Marketing Specialist. Um, and I would like to introduce our special guest, uh, Bassmaster Elite Pro Fisherman, um, Mr. Chad Pipkins. And Chad, we're so happy to have you here today, man. I'm happy to be here. While we were muted, I was just getting ready to start dancing if the mute button didn't come off. So I'm just <laughs> not to embarrass myself just yet. So we still have time. All right, cool, cool. We can make that happen because I think we've seen some of your dances when you've had some of your catches on the boat. So um, we, we know that you're fully capable. Um, as we're coming in and you know we're you know the spring fishing season is upon us and of course there's uh fishermen and fisher women that they're wanting to know you know how can they get the elusive i love the names the lunkers the hogzillas the swamp donkeys the hydrilla gorillas you name it and they want to catch them um in, in fact our uh, southern regional manager sent me a picture um he's down in georgia and he's with our battery um, watering system division and he had a picture of a uh, about a six pounder that he catches that minnow. So I'm kind of hoping if he listens to you, he can maybe catch something a little bit bigger. But yeah. with him catching the six pounder, I know that that um, you have caught some big fish. So what is your biggest catch to date that you had on the hook and you put in the boat? Biggest catch is going to get a little bigger this year, we hope. But last year was pretty special. I think I caught four or five fish over eight pounds last year, and I landed uh, one of them at uh, Lake Chickamauga. It was a 9.8, and that was like, uh, I think a month after I got my new personal best fish at um, at Lake Fork, and that was an 8.10. But I did have one on while I caught that, or fought that 9.8. I had a big crankbait. I had a 9.8 on one hook, and I had one that was probably between 11 and 13, and it, that one came out of the boat. So we are going back to Chick this year, and uh, maybe, maybe it should be 12 or 13 or 14, and we'll catch it this year. So we're awesome. Gonna... That sounds cool. Pay attention, Rob. Um, so um with that it, it, and of course you're pro fisherman but you just don't automatically become a pro fish fisherman um tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got started and what drives your passion for fishing yeah i, I grew up uh fishing but not you know bass fishing like i, I never turned to fish like well these kids are starting at like eight nine ten i started when i was 16 so but i grew up uh, my parents had a place on the lake i used to catch a lot of perch and rock bass you know, just fishing with minnows. And then I started uh, liking bass fishing. I think when I was probably 13, 12, 13. I, I literally just backpack, two rods strapped across the, the, the front of my bike and I, I would pond hop. And that's, I, I started my passion for bass fishing, you know, just fishing in ponds. And then I fished that first tournament when I was uh, 16 with a friend of mine's dad. And we caught one bass and it was a whopping uh, 15 ounces, but it's, <laughs> that's still the same lake where I won my first tournament. And uh, I grew up, playing sports and being competitive. I work hard. I also like to play. I like outdoors. I like to gamble a little bit. And I love nature. And literally like a tournament, a bass fishing tournament is every one of those things I like, like thrown into a melting pot. And it, it's uh, it's a good thing we can make a little bit of a living at it because it is addicting. Like it's it's what, it's everything I like about sports and athletics and, and competition and speed and outdoors. And it's all thrown into one and it, it makes for a good time. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes it can be a little frustrating, but usually good. <laughs> no kidding. And I'm sure there's a lot of other tournament fishermen out there and, you know, uh, um, on the amateur level that feel that way too. So it's kind of awesome. And, and speaking of tournaments, obviously you, you, you fish the Bassmaster Elite Series and through this pandemic, uh, there's been somewhat of a hiatus um, where you guys haven't been able to fish the tournaments. And to my understanding, we're coming into the restart and we're going to be pushing into June here. Um, so, so tell us about that. What's happening with the restart? Yeah, it's a little, uh, a little crazy, obviously up in Michigan here, we're a little more impacted than others. We couldn't even fish <laughs> for a while, um, but we're excited to get rolling again. We've been off, uh, not canceling, but just postponing, which is good. So our business, instead of 
losing that two or three months, we're just going to shift it. So you're going to see a lot of fall fishing this year, which is going to be exciting because we don't typically fish in the fall. It's a different style. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to get going. We've got a, we kick off, um, I leave next Tuesday to kind of go down and start scouting a little bit. And then I'll, I'll fish our first event that week of June 10th. And uh, that's at Lake Eufaula, Alabama. And then we actually have the first time ever, like a mega North swing. I always, I always joke, like I, I usually finish strong because I grew up up North smallmouth fishing and seems to sure. fit me well. Um, but this is the first year we truly have like a split schedule. We have four events up North. We've got three in uh, New York and one in Michigan. So I am very excited. Hope we go to Eufaula and do well. Then we've got four events up North and it's, uh, it's going to be a good year. You can see some different guys do well because it's a different season. All right, very cool. And of course, you're mentioning doing a little more fishing at tournaments in the fall. So we may have to have a fall fishing webinar too, you know, just saying. So I'll be ready to cut into my tailgating time a little bit because in the fall I work a little bit, but I like to hang out and tailgate because we're on the road all year long. And it's, I enjoy the fall. So we're just going to have to enjoy it fishing this year. A little bit. Right on. Right on. So, so, so with that, you know, and I know you've got, out, you've done a little practice out of Lake St. Clair and such, and, and um, as we get ready for the spring, um, how do you start planning um, your setup for the spring fishing season? You know, how, what does that look like when you start out and, and um, um, how do you load the boat and that kind of thing? Yeah, the, the big thing, and any, anybody else out there can attain to this, is when you're fishing in tournaments, whether it's small scale or big scale, like when you get to the lake, you want to be worried about catching fish and not worried about things breaking, like electronics not working, boats, stuff being not rigged. So, like, I try to do a good job in the off season, you know, get, make sure the truck maintenance is up to date. Make, and when we order the boats, get the boats set up. I run wires with all the guys at Lake Drive. We run all our own wires just to make sure you know, everybody has their own little niche on how they want their grass laid out. So I want to be there for some of that to, that way I know like they're, they're at the right angles and the right places. And you, then you get that time to go out and test some stuff. I mean, I'm not going to Lake St. Clair right now to, you know, get better at fishing. That's going to help me necessarily when we go to Yafala, but I am going there to go through the motions and one to make sure my stuff's working. Cause I don't know about you guys out there, but when I put something away, things just break. Like I had squirrels get in my car and nibble on wires, like weird things happen when I put things away for a long time. So I want to make sure I'm going through all the loose ends. So when I get to the lake, all I have to focus on is fishing and, and you know, where to do, where to find those fish and, and my gear is ready to go rigged and I can put all my time and what's needed and finding those little fish or big fish. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so kind of with that said, um, you know, I'm sure people are waiting with bated breath, and yes, pun is intended, um, to kind of take a look at our fishing tips and, and and tell us what you got, and hopefully give some insight to everybody on on uh, what they can do where they can uh, um, catch the big fish. Yeah, uh, first of all, springtime fishing is one of the times of the year when you you really the, the fish are more vulnerable. So you've got fish that live all offshore, trees, main lake, whatever. In the spring, it's like, and they just they suck to the bank. So a lot of those big fish that normally are a little smarter, you know, they get dumb. It's just, just like hunting when bucks are in rut and it's, you know, the, the female male issues when, when we get our heads messed up, you know, it, it does bad things sometimes. And that's what happens to the fish. So they get vulnerable when they get up there and they make mistakes. So unfortunately, us as fishermen, we can have some fun and it's a good chance to catch some of the biggest fish of your life. So um, looking at the first uh, slide here, chatterbait fishing. This is a, like a bladed jig. This has been huge in the last five to 10 years. Before that, you really never heard of it. And now it's just a great way. There's a uh, little blade on the front of the jig. Those of you that fish a lot, just throws off a lot of vibration. It's really, really good for stained and muddy water. And the nice thing about it is it, when you're fishing around grass, you really feel that vibration. It has a like a really hard wobble. And so you're gonna know, if there's a touch of grass on that, you know right away. So if your bait's not acting right, you're gonna know it and it allows you to snap that bait from the grass. Um, and again, you're usually fishing this around grassy flats, points and edges. And in the spring, a lot of times those fish can group up. So it's very common, you know, when you get a bit in one place, you know, put your talons down and you're going to make multiple casts. Because if you find that right patch, sometimes it's just a thin spot in the grass. Sometimes it's thicker or sometimes it's just an underwater feature where maybe there's a little high spot. And okay. you can catch multiple fish in the same cast. So it's really important when you do get bit. You know, to slow down and, and make those casts and change the retrieve up a little bit. Every day is a little different. Some days they might want a steady wind. Other days you need to be ripping the bait out of the grass um, to get those reaction strikes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
and, and with that, you know, and as we look at the different baits, and you know, like 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 with the uh, chatter baits, we're in muddy water and such, and and like now as we look at jerk baits, clear to stain. Um, how much effect does weather play on it? And when you say on that, you know, it's muddy water, but it may be a real sunny day or it may be a cloudy day. Um, you know, diff different barometric pressures, high pressures, low pressures. You know, how does that all work into this? Yeah, wet weather's literally everything. I mean, there's so so much, like, we're not better casters than each other often, or, or the guy that does this better. It's the guys that make the best decisions. And usually the guys that make the best decisions are the ones that make the changes on the water. And, and usually weather drives all that. If you're out there catching them um, on a, it's like right now it's cloudy at my house. It's kind of low, low pressure, little fronts coming in with some rain. Like that's a day they might eat the steady wind on the on the uh, channel bait or on a jerk bait really fast snaps because their their strike zone's a lot bigger. And you get days where it's post frontal, high skies, like no wind, and those fish really hunker down. So maybe you, you see that uh, clump of grass or whatever on your 360 imaging and you don't throw it one cast and, and catch them real quick. You literally might have to make, you know, four or five, six casts and kind of saturate the area because those fish are going to travel less far. So you got to fish. These baits are all good styles of fishing, but you really got to adjust the retrieves based on uh, the conditions. Okay. So, and, and like looking at this, it, as far as the jerk baits concerned, it's mm -hmm. typically more uh, clear to stained water. You know, you don't, it's really muddy. You're not, jerk bait it just doesn't throw off enough vibration because it sits still a lot. The big thing with the jerk bait is that that cadence. You know, if it's colder water earlier in the season, you really want to slow the jerks down. So you maybe you twitch a couple times. And then I, sometimes I get on the deal, like I twitch a couple times, then I, I come down, I grab a drink of water. You know, it's seven, eight <laughs> seconds later, you go to move it again, and then one hits. And, and those little clues, if you can pick up on those, it's saying, hey, you know, get your head right. You need to slow down. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we're you're so rushed to get that next bite. And I've done it before, like when the conditions are right, I fished through fish. If I just would have like stepped back for a minute and sure. picked up on some clues, like you're having followers a lot and the, and the fish aren't committing, something's not right. Like maybe even that's, maybe you need to switch from the jerk bait to a little swim bait or just to a worm, some different presentation. But those fish should be committing if you if you make the changes as they happen. And okay. another great way to catch those is like, it can be points, it can be rock piles, it can be sand or grab. The, the big thing with the jerk bait, obviously it's got a nice mess of treble hooks to hook on everything. So you sure. want to throw that around things that are more sparse, that thinner grass, uh, suspended over rocks, gravel, and uh, that kind of deal. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to the next one. Let's listen to yeah. bait, Chad. Yeah, and this is this is kind of like the in between for me. Um, it's they're both good baits, and they can be fished in that clear to muddy water, depending on you know the color. Like it, you see, that's kind of a, a clear color I have there. It's a real shad. That's maybe more of a clear water lipless crankbait. It does have a good loud rattle in it, so you know those fish can feel that with their lateral line. Mm -hmm. And that spinner bait that I have shown there, it's got two willow leaf blades. That's more of a clear water spinner bait. You know those blades are slender; they don't have quite the vibration. Um, but if you take a spinner bait like that and put a big like Colorado on it, it's a big like thumper blade. It, mm -hmm. You fish it a lot slower and it moves a lot of water. And and those are the type of little changes you can make, you know, within the baits to say, hey, this is a clear water bait. But when I throw it with a different blade, it's really a dirty water bait. And just these are as versatile as they get. Like the spinner bait gets overlooked a lot because it it can be just a dummy like do nothing. If they're eating it, you can just throw it out there and wind it in. And okay. sometimes that's that's a technique where you're burning the spinner bait, but a lot of times it's it's making accurate casts, different angles, and and picking apart cover like bushes or brush piles in the spring. I like that spinner bait because it really uh, the other baits are are search baits, and you're covering water trying to find them in the grass. But that spinner okay. bait you can really pick apart like high percentage areas, like where you know maybe that giant she's not just on this break line; she's sitting on this brush pile here, and. Uh -huh. A bush and I can make multiple casts and that spinner bait will literally come through anything. You can walk that through and just you can work it through almost like a Texas rig worm. Okay. Okay. And, and as you talk about casting too, you know, and you're talking technique and and like maybe you'll throw six or eight cast out. Um are, are you are you spotting or are you trying to do incremental degrees to come across to come across an area? 
Um, yes and no. It's, it's it's really just about different angles. Like if you if okay. you come on a bank, I had it happen in an event um, in the fall. You know, I had a co-angler in, in the back of my boat. I've been a co-angler for years. It's a great way to learn. But you also got to be respectful of the guy in the front of the boat because, you know, that guy's trying to make a living, some of them, you know, and every mm -hmm. fish counts. So it was one of those deals where I was going down the bank this way and there was a nice tree in the water and I made, and it, and it, it veed off at the end and I was able to make one cast this way. My plan was to make one, one, and then one right down the V. And, okay. you know, I threw the upper part and then he threw right over me on the lower part. And he caught a fish that I think I was like 21 at the time and it ended up costing me a check like, like a five thousand dollar check when you're twenty one. Oh, oh, that's a big check, a big check any day, really. Yeah. And it was funny because the next day I ended up finishing like fifty second. I needed to be in fiftieth to make that five grand check. And mm -hmm. the next day I had a calling with a super nice guy, just like the other guy was as well. But he just he gave me more space, and I actually went to that same piece of cover and made the cast on the upper part, the lower part, and then I got the right angle and made one right down the V and caught the biggest fish of that week. And it, I, when I caught that fish, I'm like, man, thank you. And he's like, thank you for what? I'm like, for, you know, giving me, because he would have caught that fish if he made that cast, you know, uh -huh. it's the same thing the day before. So it is, it's crazy how specific they can be. Sometimes they just chase. Other times, like, they need that bait coming across at the right angle, you know, to get them to fire. Okay. All right. So, so as you're talking about and cast into the trees and that kind of thing, um, what about like the, the, the top water baits and that kind of thing? Yeah, and that gets into the next the next slide there. Um, it talks about, you know, top water, wacky worm kind of deal. And this is really like chatterbait fishing is, is amazing pre-spawn in around that, you know, early part of the spawn. But the top water and wacky worm stuff, that's really what I like. I mean, it's it's kind of when they're already up on the bank, the majority of the fish are actively spawning and some of those fish are on their way out. The big thing mm -hmm. with this is obviously the, that worm doesn't have a lot of vibration. So you really want that to be a little cleaner clean the stained water, like muddy water, probably not a great um, bait choice for muddy water. Um, sure. The big thing with spawning like post-spawn fish is naturally after the fish lay eggs, they guard fry and the fry usually mm -hmm. sit up high in the water column. So if you're throwing a bait that's going down and it's on the bottom, those fish are looking up to protect the fry. So it, your bait's going to be beneath them. So you could be around the right fish dragging your bait on the bottom but those fish are suspended and looking up. So that top water bait is a great way to, you know, cover water, you know, go down edges, over top grass, over top brush piles, like places where those fry might be hanging out. And you can get those fish to come up and it, it is a blast. And it's just some of the best strikes you'll get. And um, the, the thing with the wacky worm then is I call that kind of like a cleanup bait. You know, after you find an area with some fish, maybe you catch a few on, on top, there's nothing better than a slow falling. Like I think that one there's a lunker hunt. It's a lunker stick. It's just a weighted okay. inch straight bait hooked right in the middle. And it just ever so slowly, like it pulsates when it on the way down, like kind of shimmies. And it just draws mm -hmm. a lot of strikes. Those days I was talking about post frontal high skies. So okay. often you might have that practice day where you're just, they're eating the top water and you're just crushing them because it's overcast and the conditions are right. Well, then the tournament rolls around and, it's not going to be overcast anymore. It's going to be high skies, sun, cold front, and that's when you probably want to pick up the wacky worm a bit more, you know, because they're, they're okay. not going to come up and, and hit that top water. Okay. So, so a question on the wacky worm too, because of course you go into your local sporting goods store and you go into the fishing fishing section and you see wacky worms in every color under the rainbow. You yeah. know, how how do you work and do color selection? Is it based on on the type of water that you're fishing in? Is there I mean, do, do fish see color? I mean, you know, is it, is it the kind of thing that, that is there a more striking color? You know, how, how do you work that? Yeah, they do. I'm, I'm really simple. Like some guys really get into like a drop of color here, a flake of something here, a shade of this. Like in the end of the day, they are fish and they have the brain the size of the pea. Sometimes they can be <laughs> frustrated. But just keep it, it's more just keeping it simple for yourself. If you have to go through 78 colors of worms, like you're going to be spending more time rehooking and redoing this, like have a good general knowledge of when they're going to do what. When you get into sure. that um, clean water, you know, I'm throwing green pumpkin, watermelon red, or, or like the ones, it's like watermelon with, it's got purple flake. It looks a lot like a, a bluegill, but it's, a, it's those okay. natural colors, those greens with a little bit of flakes of the red and the purple because those little sunfish, they have a lot of that purple and red. You know, then as the water gets a little darker, 
you might throw a black and blue or June bug. And that's really the color that I throw is it's simple. There's, you know, three or four colors. My big thing is, is trying to throw the right baits for the right conditions. Like are the fish suspended? Do I need something high? Are they on the bottom? Mm -hmm. Like focus more on those changes as opposed to going through every color in the rainbow. Cause you're going to end up frustrating yourself and nine times out of 10, when they eat that wacky worm, they would have ate the other color he were thrown anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so you talk about that, and of course, we've talked about a lot of different baits. Now, as you're fishing a tournament in the day, and you can be fishing for a day, and like we talk about a high pressure, you know, and you could, you know, you can head out at six in the morning, and then by noon, a low pressure has come through, and things change up. Um, how often are you changing out baits? Um, um, you know, throughout the course, obviously conditions play the factor, but. But will you find yourself changing out quite a bit, or will you stay consistent with one? Or yeah, it, it really depends. Um, some some places, depending on the style you're doing, like maybe if you're fishing a worm in a brush pile, like in the fish that you know it's the summer, they're in those brush piles. They just they're going to be more active. So maybe on those days you may be able to throw a crankbait near the brush pile when it's low pressure and and, and some clouds, because maybe those fish venture off a little more. Other days you got to put your bait right into the heart of the brush pile when it's sunny. And high pressure because they they hunker down so it's the big thing like day to day everybody always like why do you have so many rods you know we we do because they're like golf clubs you, you you have maybe i've got eight to ten rods on my deck if i'm really into something i know what's going on maybe i have two of the one thing and then two of another thing but then i have what i call like four four or five opportunity rods out where that's not my main deal but it might be something that i pick up for five to ten minutes here or there and okay. try to take advantage of those bite windows because you see all if you're watching bass fishing they make an hour-long tv show and you see the guys you know everybody's just wail, catching them just wailing on them that's not how it plays out there's there's bite windows you don't see the struggle unless you watch bass live you see the struggle when i let a tournament by 10 pounds and i catch three fish the next day the struggle is real and it happens <laughs> and that's what you don't see that unless you watch the live stuff and it's it's being able to be ready for that bite window maybe like you said the wind picks up for an hour or, or all of a sudden some, some clouds move in and you can pick up that crankbait or that jerk bait and maybe cover a little water and put a few fish in the boat and, and it gives you confidence then to slow down and go back to what you were doing. So it's just taking advantage of those small bite windows. All right, cool. All right, so, so we've done that and we've used all these different baits. Now, all of a sudden we have a full live well on both sides. We have the fish that are caught. We have fish that are called. Um, obviously, Obviously, with your boats, we've uh, we've done some retrofit with with flow ride aeration and with the power stream nozzles. How, how important is the aeration for your fish? Oh, it, air, it's huge. I mean, in the you guys that fish in the winter, like January, February, that's when the fish are the healthiest and the less stressed. And the water's the coolest, the most oxygen, and it's not as big of a deal then. But when we get in like this time of year, you know, around the spawn, the fish are a little beat up. They're a little more vulnerable. Same thing in the summer when it gets really hot, oxygen levels are a little lower. You got to have good airflow, and you know that the bass cat live well I have has got great aeration, and they actually have another. Uh, there's an extra pump in there for pump out, just to take the, you literally pump the water out, and we even go another notch with the that flow. I bring my boat in every year, and they take that 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 straight pump out pump that nozzle and flow right has a two rater yeah. nozzle. So then it's actually like a, a sprayer head in one, where I can pump out, or it's an extra live well, and the other or a live well aerator and the other nice thing about that is things happen like i've had a live well pump you know you have uh somebody in the back or a co-angler yourself you know cut a line clipping here's a good tip don't put your line clippings in the boat because i've actually had them go down <laughs> into the live well and they get in the pump and, the, and they'll kill your aerator system and i've taken out the pump and there's a four or five inch piece of line clipping and i had two fish die a long time ago in the potomac river I learned a lesson there and then I had the same thing happen because I didn't learn my lesson enough. It went one of them, I was out graphing on Ontario and I had a little six inch piece of line went down into my boat. Got, I only had a single bilge at the time and it killed my bilge pump, was taking all water over and had to idle back in because I couldn't get on plane and almost sunk my boat. Oh, so no. in a Ziploc bag is the main, <laughs> main thing. But you definitely, like I was getting at before I went on my line clipping rant, you, you got to have good airflow and I do everything I can to keep those fish healthy because it's it's money for us. You know, want to obviously keep them alive for resource wise, but it's just it's important with what we do to keep them alive and having 
any backup plan, like an extra aeration system, or just having that, like when I run, we make a 40 minute run, I turn all those pumps on. It's like a cold water jacuzzi. We got air flowing in here or there, bubbles everywhere, and it just, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, and of course, talking at that, you know, people can go to www.flow-rite.com and, and take a look at, at, at our marine products on our site. And so, so, uh, yeah, we appreciate that, Chad, for the aeration. So, you know, at this point in time, people have had the opportunity, I keep asking questions, but we've yeah. had the opportunity for people to uh, filter questions in. So, so I'll kind of pass it to Shannon. Shannon, do you have some questions for us? Or I should say for Chad, because I know nothing. <laughs> what? <laughs> Brain plug master, come on. <laughs> Good to hear, just a minute. Okay, I do have a few for you. Okay. Um, so what kind of graphs do you use? Uh, graphs, I, I run all Hummingbird and um, I actually run the Helix version, Helix 10s. And they have another, they've got Onyxes, a lot of nice versions. I choose to run the Helix 10s because I'm not crazy about the touch screen. Just because mm -hmm. sometimes I switch with gloves when it's really cold, I like the buttons. And I just me being the, the one that I feel like weird things happen to. I actually run all of the same ones. So I run two at the console and two at the dash, but they're all the same graph that way. If something were to happen, I have one, they all serve separate purposes, but if I were to have something happen and one were to go bad or I've, I've got a spare, so I could use one for the other. So I, I like to have backup plans on backup plans. <laughs> so what's your go-to bait and go-to tube color? um it's it's really hard to beat not being not crazy about color it's hard to beat green pumpkin just because you can throw a green pumpkin and uh when it's muddy you can throw it when it's clear but just a great it's a great place to start it's still natural and as far as the go-to color i'm sorry color but uh bait it really depends on clarity i say that um but the one bait i've I feel the most confident with you is, is that uh, dang uh, DC 300 from Dominique. It's the one that I caught him on really good at Texas when we were on Bass Live. I, I catch him on it at St. Clair. It's just a, a bait that I catch him, you know, small mouth, large mouth, spawn, pre spawn, post spawn, and I like to have it in my hand. <laughs> okay. O ring versus no O ring on a wacky worm, weed guard hooks, or no weed guards? Um, yeah, that's a good question. A lot of guys throw the O-ring, they, they say it lasts a little longer. Um, me personally, I don't. And it's just because it depends on the, the stick bait you're using. There's some other good stick baits out there that have good, a good fall rate, but they are definitely higher salted and they, uh, they break up on a fish or no, or a couple casts. That lunker hunt, one that I use, the plastic's a little more durable. So if I'm putting that in there, I, I feel like, you know, I'm gonna catch four or five fish on each lunker stick, which is, which is pretty solid with wacky worm. And as far as the weed guard, um, Trocar makes a, a great, I think it's the TK-137, and it's a great, great wacky worm. If they'd make one with the weed guard, one without, if I'm throwing around like open water, you know, where I'm casting at light spots, like rocks and dark spots, maybe for shallow water, smallmouth or something, I'm not going to throw a weed guard. Um, but anytime I'm skipping docks or anything, being up north, we skip a lot of docks with wacky worms. Mm -hmm. And it, you just you're gonna get into too much trouble if you don't throw a weed guard so there's no reason not to have it on when you're fishing around brush and docks that kind of stuff but open water light grass i'm gonna, probably gonna throw one without one um and then adam wants to know if you're excited for champlain adam i am way jacked up about champlain because there's a few lakes in the country where i feel like i should have won already or i i really have a chance to win as Champlain is one of them, Oneida is one of them, and uh, the James River in Virginia. And those are like three places that I just, I'm like, I've been so close to winning there. And I had, last time we were there with the Opens, I uh, had an okay first day, but lost like three fish that were close to four and a half, five pounds. They just were biting weird. That the pressure came in. I was actually catching them on top, like we were talking about, in like two to three foot waves, but they wouldn't commit to the bait, but they would still hit it. And the last day I caught 20 pounds, and had three five pounders and lost two five pounders. Like it was so close to being ridiculous. And it's one of those places where I've had my, I know where it goes down. I've got rock piles, I've got gravel flats, I've got grass. I 
when I find some schools of fish, mix it in with the specific cast, like I know it can happen. I just, it's, it's about making the right decisions on the water, when to pick up the jerk bait, when to put down the top water and when to go through the drop shot. That's the biggest thing out there is knowing how to make the changes. And I'm getting close. <laughs> <laughs> and then so, yeah, so Andy wants to know if you have any tips for spring smallie fishing on Erie to avoid the crowds on LSC. Um, yeah, the, the fish in the Erie is different. Uh, if you can get around the islands, um, obviously Canada is not technically open yet, um, but they are open on the Ohio side. So it's the same kind of thing, like Lake St. Clair is amazing because you've got a giant flat water bowl and every fish that suspends and eats perch and alewife in the summer, they all go to the bank and they just get pounded by groups of 30, 40, 50 boats in those rocky, shallow gravel sections. Um, the same thing happens on Erie, it just doesn't get as, as much attention. So if you're out in Erie and can get around, you know, some of those islands, any sections that you know have that rock, that hard bottom gravel, you know, which most of Erie does, but there, there's a lot of sections that are just sand, um, but you definitely want to get away from that just sand stuff and get around those hard bottom, you know, rock uh, fingers around the, you know, Peely Island, if you can get around there, there's places where they load up in the spring and the Bass Islands. And the one that's straight out from Cedar Point also, I'm drawing a blank right now, but a lot of good Lake Erie uh, spring, summer, um, spring smallmouth fishing. And, and they do get less pressure there. The, the big crowds go to St. Clair for sure. Awesome. And then are you using braided line or what do you recommend in thickness for your line? Um, it really depends on what you're doing. Like if you're talking um, Lake Erie or Lake St. Clair, um, if I'm throwing drop shots and like tubes and stuff, typically with the tube or like that kind of rig, um, anything that's in direct contact, like a tube or a shaky head that's around the bottom and being around rock or brush, I'm going to throw like a 12 pound Sunline braid that's SX1 and then I'll have a 10 pound leader on the end of that, a fluorocarbon leader and that's Sunline Sniper. Um, just because I, I want 10 pounds just in case, you know, that's down there banging in the rocks a little bit, um, helps with abrasion. And then mm -hmm. uh, if I'm doing a drop shot, that's going to be usually eight. I don't like to go less than eight. Occasionally I'll use seven pound, but just straight sunline, eight pound fluorocarbon for that. Because again, in, in the drop shot, your weight's on the bottom, your bait's up here. So the majority of the time, the rocks are hitting the line that's beneath your hook. So you're not getting your line frayed above the hook. So that's... For the finesse stuff, that's what I do. And then if I'm out there, uh, like crankbaits, typically, you know, 12 to 14 pound line for crankbaits and a lot of the other stuff with uh, um, chatterbaits, spinnerbaits, it's 16 to 20 pound fluorocarbon. It's pretty common. And then our friend Rob from down in Georgia wants to know if any, if you have any tricks to prevent the bird nesting with his bait caster. Ouch, that happens. <laughs> You know, the dumbest thing about that is the first bait caster I ever had, I sent back because I'm like, this thing's got to be broke. This is stupid. Because every time I cast it, it would just, nobody explained to me that there's a little, I'm not trying to insult you, Rob, but some people don't even know that there's a little dial on the, the inside part of the reel that's like the brake. And you have to set that for every bait. So the easiest way to start doing it is you have your bait that's tied onto your rod. You hold it at like 45 degrees and you hit the button. But you keep your uh, you keep your thumb on the spool, and you turn the brake, like dial it up or down until the bait. You want the bait to barely fall. Like you can, if you turn the brake up tight enough, you can hit the button and it doesn't even come out. And like that's a, a way to start. It's very hard to get a backlash when the line doesn't want to come out. But it's also very hard to make a long cast. So that's a good way to start. Like have it be a little tight. Throw it out there. The line's going to go and it's going to get pulled down. But you're not going to have a backlash. So next time you maybe loosen it up a little bit. And then keep loose and eventually you'll kind of get the feel for you know how how you need to adjust that for each bait nobody told me that when i did it i just wrecked schools of line and sent my bait <laughs> guys <laughs> uh tim wants to know what is your favorite way to catch northern michigan smallmouth that are roaming the shallows before they make beds um it's it's hard to be like i guess it depends on the, how cold the water is if it's shallow is kind of relative it's like two to four feet it's still hard to beat them on a, on a wacky worm i've caught them really well we fished cayuga up in uh, new york and I, I caught them really well going behind people with the weightless wacky worm just because they still don't see it a lot i don't know a lot of guys still don't throw it um 
but so that's a great way to catch them when they're kind of in that roaming process because they just it, it's got such a slow fall rate and typically it's clear that they're going to see it longer another big thing and if it's this is a colder is the just a hair jig a lot of guys up north throw a black hair jig eighth ounce it, it's you don't have to do anything you throw it out then you literally just slow wind it it's painful sometimes but it's when it's really cold like the water's in the 40s that's probably the best way to catch them but i we don't fish a bunch when it's in the 40s so usually for me it's pre-spawn i'm throwing a jerk bait around and then if it's shallow enough and clear enough where i can see them i'm standing up high and then i'm leading them with either a drop shot or that wacky worm so if i can see them i'll throw in front of them with the drop shot of the wacky worm but besides that i'm making really long casts with a jerk bait trying to get it to them before they see me awesome so we have two more when you pre-fish for a tournament how do you find fish and then know they'll still be there during the tournament how do you know you have enough fish for a four-day competition i always wish i had enough that, that's one of those deals um, <laughs> the question we get asked a lot like you know how do you practice and i started to realize like how i like to fish like i'm very specific with my castle i don't like to just go down the bank i don't like to just roam in grass like I like to have lots of little specific targets because those are places that fish are constantly moving to and from. And the, I feel like the more of those high percentage places I can fish, the better chance I have of getting bit. You know, sometimes it's, it's just a timing thing. Like I, I might fish a spot three or four times and on the fourth time I catch two or three good ones. So like, that's mm -hmm. how I choose to practice. And the, the big thing in with the fishing is, with the tournament fishing is getting in an area that you can move around in and try different things. Like, when I first started, I would fish, you know, this section of lake, this section, and then this section. Then the tournament would be done, and I'd kind of had a few bites here, here, and here. Well, the problem is, then you, and it's hard to fish mentally because then you, you might fish a couple things over here, and then you want to get on the big motor and run 10 to 20 minutes over here, and then over, and you end up chasing how you got bit, you know, previously. Versus mm -hmm. if you can kind of settle in and maybe a two to five mile section. It allows you to it allows you to bounce around and, and make those decisions, but then you're only driving for two minutes. And the big thing is once you get, you know, get in on what's going on that day, you can start to develop. But the best tournaments I've ever had, I'm not catching them only where I got bit in practice. I'm catching them on other areas that I marked as well. So if I get in an area and, and I get a few bikes on a brush pile here and one here, maybe I spend 20 minutes. I mark another 10 brush files. I don't need to fish every one of those brush files that day. I just, I know they're there. So that way, if I start to get bit on these brush files, I know I can maybe mix in some new stuff too. So the guys that really get into it, and, and when, when you see people win tournament, and you hear it a lot, like you don't usually win the tournaments you think you're gonna. A lot of times you get so dialed in in practice, and then the bite goes away, you don't make the changes. But a lot of times when the guys win, that win the tournament, it's you kind of start getting those clues on day one and on day two and so you're actually fishing natural and you're fishing the fish as they are not as they were and that's it's hard to do because you're 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 fishing stuff in a tournament that maybe you've never even fished before but those are some of the best tournaments i've had cool all right we're gonna wrap it up so one last question from john do you feel that you catch more fish on a cloudy day or a sunny day well, I like the sun personally, just for me, because I like to get some sun um, while we're strapped down in all of our undergarments. But it's it's different. Every fish is different, and the main difference is northern versus southern. Typically, if you go south, you're going to do way better on cloudy, you know, low pressure days with both large and smallmouth. The river smallmouth down there, it's just they're more like a large mouth. When you have those systems and fronts that move in, you're going to catch them better when it's like a light misting rain. They're gonna have a bigger strike zone. They're gonna eat spinner baits, crank baits, top waters, and you're gonna be able to cover water and put your bait in front of more fish. Now, when you come up north, the, the opposite happens. I, I think it's because of how clear our water is. Uh, Smallmouth are typically, they're really visual feeders and they suspend a lot. So when you get that hot, you get that nice sun, you know, a calm day, you wouldn't think to throw a crankbait or a dirt bait then, but that's that's actually when they're eating the most. And I've had some of the best days out in St. Clair throwing a crankbait when it's dead calm or throwing a swim bait. They just, they want to eat then because they can see and it's the conditions are right for them. And then the opposite happens when that, that cloud sets in 
and maybe he gets a win. I honestly think instead of grouping them up and suspending them, they, they scatter along the bottom. And that's, uh, that's really why you don't, uh, when you talk to people that graph on like the Tennessee river, you visually, you go over the boat, over the fish with your boat and you see them on your down scan and, and sonar. You don't see a lot of smallmouth when you're scanning. And I think that's because the way they set up, they really set up along the bottom mm -hmm. and when the cloud happens and that pressure comes in, it actually sets them up more along the bottom. And so you're, you're even less likely to see them. And it, it is crazy though, because how often have you been out there when you hook that small mouth that you thought you might've saw one, then all of a sudden there's 10 on your graph or you see them like they, they get curious when one of their buddies is coming up because he got something to eat. So it's just same kind of thing. Like when you get bit, pay attention because you're going to see more with your eyes or on your graph. So definitely a big difference between Northern fish and Southern fish. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much, Chad. We appreciate all the input and I'm sure everybody appreciates the input too. And, and hopefully they all have good fishing stories to tell. Um, Shan Shannon, um, as far as for this webinar, everybody will get a link to it, correct? Yes. Yep. I'll send it back out so everyone can rewatch and um, all that good stuff. Cool. Well, appreciate uh, you guys having me. Absolutely, Chad. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. I know you'd probably rather be out of Lake St. Clair right <laughs> now, but, but, but sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. You know. We'll be so. on the water next week. We'll be good to go. Right on, right on, and good luck. And I and I hope it's a hundred thousand dollar check. So you're gonna get one. This this is the year. Wait this for it. It's gonna happen. All right, yeah. cool. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, thanks, guys. Thank yeah. you.